Well, he's bred for the job, he's learned from the best, and he's making a quick impression. Welcome, Ollie Sangster, rookie trainer to the show, with pattern races under his belt and much to look forward to. We're in the middle of sales season as well. Neil Channing's chowing down on one of those uh, pastries that'll keep him quiet for a little I while. I, one thing wanna, I, I do want to have one while Harry was talking about his Crohn's disease. <laughs> one, 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 one thing I don't want to do, Ollie, is to, is to keep you quiet, because you are making, making a little bit of a splash. You would say... This has been quite a long time coming, I think, even though we would look at you and think, well, he's fresh out of school. Not quite so, is it? There's a lot of experience under the belt. Uh, yeah, I'd say I was, I was ready to get going anyway, but uh, naturally any new business, you're, you're cautious as, as to how it's going to start, but thankfully it's, it's started the way I would have hoped it had, yeah. And I know how determined you are to make a go of it as, as Ollie Sangster, not just a Sangster. But when the name is so legendary, when it's so steeped in the traditions of the game, you're never going to be able to to leave that behind or or forget about it. How how aware were you as a as a kid growing up of of how big a deal your family had been in the sport and how big a deal your grandfather had been? Uh, I would say positively sort of unaware, really. Really, you know, uh, lucky to have grown up at Manton. Sure, horses horses were always out the window, and that was sort of sort of second nature. Um, but obviously, a lot of the success came, I suppose, at the end of the seventies, the eighties, and you know that's way before my time. And and you know, obviously. Lucky people always saying what a great man he was and all the, you know, all the good horses they could recount. But but as far as me being a kid growing up, you know, f f fairly sort of, yeah, it w wouldn't have been as prevalent as you might have thought. Yeah. But the passion was obviously. Yeah, in, the passion was always there, and, and and like I said, lucky to have grown up around the horses, and and I've always worked and worked, you know, enjoyed the horses since a young age. So so inevitably, me going into the industry w was never a huge surprise, you know. And tell me about how how your parents felt about how you going into the industry. Um, I'd, I'd say I'd say make mixed emotions. You know, you know. On, on one hand, I'm sure delighted that that you're, you're following them into it. Um, but but equally, you know, they, they know the trials and tribulations of the industry and were naturally cautious and perhaps thought perhaps I was best to have pursued something else beforehand. You know, um, it's obviously a, a tricky industry and 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 we're all aware of that. So so. I mean, Mum initially thought that it would be better maybe to go and learn another occupation first, and then you always have that to fall back on. Um, but, but no, no, this was always the way I was going to go, and once once that was set in stone, they've always been very supportive since then. Yeah. And in a nice way, you do strike me as a guy in a bit of a hurry as well. You you weren't going to be super patient to try out a load of other things. Uh, no, look, look. Once I once I had my heart set on this, you know. You know, that was always the way we were going to go. What was it about the whole business that was, was driving you? Was it always training? Was it always that? No, not always that. I, I love the bloodstock. Obviously, mm. Dad breeds horses, so, so we've always uh, you know, been associated with that. And that that's a, still, still is a big th thing for me now. I love working the sales. I love pedigrees. I love all of that. So, so I could have gone that way. But, but for me, the training, I love it because it's sort of so much more... It's, it's, it's quicker. It's more results-based. Obviously, so is the bloodstock, but... It's more sort of day to day, and, mm. and I love working with the horses on a more day to day nature and the sort of high performance nature of the training as well, as opposed to the bloodstock. But but I mean, really, obviously, the two go very hand in hand, and and I love them both. You know, I read that there was a moment where there was a bit of a fork in the road, and you were nearly off to university. Yeah, after yeah, school. yeah. Again, na naturally, I left school, and you know, did you did you do well? Were you good at school? Yeah, yeah, I was per perfectly bright enough and, and I had places at decent enough universities um, I think I was going to go do business or economics or one of those which is which is fine um, but naturally this was the route I was always going to take so going and spending three four years at university doing a business degree to then come out and start at the bottom which invariably you have to do in racing mm -hmm. and be mucking out and learning from the bottom it it, it, it didn't seem to make sense and it, to me it made more sense to start doing that when I was 18 and start doing it when I was 21, 22. The thing is, Richard, I think you've got to have quite a bit of presence of mind to do that because you're swimming against the tide. You know, if, you're, if all your peers are going to further education and well, you're saying, <coughs> no, I'm brave enough to back myself to do this, it is swimming against the tide, really. I suppose so. It's interesting because I didn't go to university either. I had a place and I went to Poly because it got me into accounting at that stage, which was where I was going within a year rather than doing a three or four year degree because that's where I was going to go. And as you say... So you knew you wanted to, be, to work with numbers, well, work, work as an accountant? Yeah, basically that's where I decided I was going to go. And the, the, in those days there was a route into the industry. They took um, both relevant and non-relevant mm. graduates after three or four years and there used to be a route through Poly's, which of course don't exist anymore, of a year 
doing an accounting, but you had to have your job arranged in advance. So it's a bit like, you know, you, you decided you were going to go and start training and you'd arrange to go to Gay Waterhouse or Wesley Wardershaw sort of training operation because it gets you out there quicker. <clears throat> you begin to learn what you want to do. All it taught me was that, well, eventually that I didn't want to do it right the way through, but that's not the point. So I, I do sympathise with that sort of approach. If you know where you're going, you may as well get on with it rather than yeah. let your life go off <laughs> in a different tangent particularly if you're at university for three years. Yeah, <laughs> and, and like you said, sure, there were definitely times when I was probably waking up and going to work and, and, and my friends were getting in, you know? So, so um, <laughs> you know, it, it, there were times when it was tough, you know? But, but uh, the way I'm wired, that was always the, the better route for me, having a sort of uh, fairly sort of relaxed sort of schedule that university can offer you just, for me, wouldn't have suited me. And having a routine and a structure and everything, that's, for me, w would always have... have you know, been the much more viable thing to do. So, so actually, I don't think university would have worked for me, but due to what I wanted to do, that, that was never going to happen anyway. I found it suited me rather too well, which is why I have great admiration for, for your work ethic. I mean, to what extent, given what we've discussed, did you feel like I need to work two to everybody else is one because I want to prove to people that I've not just been silver spooned for the last however many years? Um... I think when I started, like, like anyone, you're, you're a kid and you just want to get your foot in the door and get going. Um, I didn't, when I went to America to work for Wesley, I didn't really have the option of working no. two to one. That, just, that was just how it was. It was just hard work. Um, but, but very rewarding work as well. Um, Tell me why it was such, so intense. Uh, so it, when you go to Keenan or Saratoga, you know, they have full cards of racing. Uh, Saratoga, it's six days a week for you know, the best part of two and a half months. Um, and then on top of that, you, know, you have the sales in August, and you have full teams of horses, staff, you know, everything. And then on top of that, you have a trainer that's not there the whole time. So, but, you know, these trainers are running two, three, multiple stables. So you, you, you end up being their representative, but more so than, you know, just a representative of the races. You know, you're, you're sort of running the stable. You're, you're, you're their eyes and ears. You're, you're, yeah, so it's, it's a 24-7, you know, there's no Sundays off. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's and full on. And you're what, like 19, 20 at the time? Yeah, or, or I was uh, 21 and yeah. 22, those and, two years. And they yeah. just, he basically just chucks you the ball and say, get on with it. Definitely. For, I mean, look, when I started, I was riding out and, and, and but things sort of progressed quickly. But nat naturally as well over there, you have a lot of, um, a lot of the employees you have are, Hispanic and whatever, so so the fact that you're English and whatever is, or English speaking anyway, is a is a is a positive, you know, and and, and helpful for dealing with owners and what have you, you know. So so, um, but yeah, it was it was a steep learning curve, but one that I'm definitely glad that I was able to do. Yeah. And would that then make you more inclined to give somebody who was just starting out more responsibility? Would you have that confidence? Yeah, I think so. I think giving someone responsibility is the fastest way to learn, and naturally. I'm, I'm, I'll easily say I've, I've probably made loads of mistakes, but hopefully you don't make the same mistakes twice, and um, that's the, you know, the fastest way to learn, I think, yeah. OK, what has made him what he is? What did you learn from him? I think he's just an out-and-out -out horseman, really, you know? He, he's very hands-on, uh, loves nothing more than... I mean, he, he still breaks in a lot of the yearlings himself, you know? Um, loves nothing more than the horses, and he'd know every horse inside out, and... Um, yeah, he's just a real out and out horseman. Yeah, I mean, he still loves to, as you say, he still loves to ride. He still, yeah, very much sort of. Yeah, and and do are you do, are, do you feel like you're in that mold? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, Wesley's in his fifties, so the fact that he's still breaking them in is fairly fairly remarkable. But but I I broke in most of my yearlings myself last year. I still ride out, not most days, but but a good few days a week. And and but because I can, I kind of you know I I, I prefer doing that to sort of just sitting in the jeep all morning. So. Mm. I'm sure there's a, there'll be a time when the tides will change a bit, but, but for now I definitely enjoy getting my hands dirty and getting stuck in. Yeah. And in terms of the actual training, I mean, I, I've heard it said quite a lot that you're not quite sure how he's doing what he's doing, but you just kind of watch and learn and try and pick it up as you go along. Is, is there something in that? Yeah, he's a bit of a sort of, I don't know, sort of mad magician. Like, a lot of it's in his head, but after a certain period of time of working for him, you sort of start to unravel it all yourself and work out and after a while, naturally, because when you're running these stables, you're you're doing basically what's in his head that you're, you know, um, applying it. So you you do start start to unravel it and 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 work out the systems and what have you. But but it definitely took more time because the way he runs it is he he's very um, you know he's got his finger on the pulse and it's 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 a lot more from his head. It's not so much from 
spreadsheets and boards and lists you know it's it happens as it as the morning goes on you know so you have to be quick thinking but but in a in a good way you know and where else have you been to kind of acquire the the knowledge that you've got now uh, i had a good just shy of two years at joseph o'brien's base there mm. over, um just literally before the yearling sales last year um which was great uh, it's my first my first real sort of season here was with uh, charlie and barry hills there which was which was great but again i was i was a kid um, and then I did a year, COVID year, um, at Hugo Palmer's just after George had left, which was good, but COVID sort of marred it a bit and it made it sort of, it just didn't really work for me. Um, but but that, that was fine, still a good experience to learn the new market gallops and the new market systems and yeah, it was good. Talk to me about Joseph O'Brien. How does he do what he does with that many horses and that many owners and that scale of operation? He seems to just do it with such cool headedness. Yeah, I don't know. Look, it's, it's a big operation and he's a very, very driven guy and he knows every horse inside out and it's a like like you said he's the sort of captain of the ship but there's a lot of very good people underneath him and, mm -hmm. and it all runs very smoothly and seamlessly and but he he's, he knows every horse inside out and he's yeah he's remarkable yep so did you have a time frame when you knew you were going to start no so, um, so how did it happen i thought it would be you know you know naturally i was happy with what i'd learned and i thought it would be you know somewhere late 20s but but ultimately you're starting a business you need to finance the business and get that off the ground um, and long story short is I part owned a good filly last year Saffron Beach mm -hmm. um, she was okay with, with James Wigan and my parents um, who we bought her to foal as a pinhook and for varying reasons she didn't make it to the yearling sales so look there's a lot of luck involved there um, and selling her basically enabled me to finance starting the business and there's you know there's no, no mystery around that that's yeah I mean that's that's pretty extraordinary isn't it you know of all the of all the great things that, are, that have happened to various members of your family over the years in terms of racehorses, that's a that's a that's a pretty significant one. That's that's right up there. And when when you bought her as a foal, you were going to reoffer her as a yearling. Yeah, yeah, and she got an injury. Yeah, we we bought a couple of foals that year, as as we would do every year. And during the yearling prep, we actually had a problem with um, one of her hooves, and just meant she missed a bit of the prep, and then she missed the sales, and then so we thought, okay, well maybe we'll breeze her. COVID year, breeze us. We decided not to. Um, so we broke her in at home and said she went into Jane, I think, in July of her two-year-old year, you know, and then she, yeah, so the rest was great. I mean, was it you that picked her out originally? Um, no, she was bought by, well, we worked closely at the foal sales with Liam oh. Norris, um, top judge, very nice man, um, and we would cumulatively make lists between um, him, him, dad and myself and then try and, try and buy a couple of them off it, you know, naturally some of them fall within your budget and some of them don't, and she was one that did. Um, and then when we bought her, James Wigan approached Dad afterwards and said, "What's your, what? A, I, I really like that foal you just bought. What's your plan with her?" So we we told him it was to pin her and sell her the next year. So that's that's when he then got involved. And then, um, you know, obviously the, the, the pin hooking didn't didn't materialise, but but it was all for luck in the end, you know. So you turned fifty five thousand into three point six million guineas. Yeah. With a yeah. bit of prize money along the way as well. Yeah, and, and some great, great days, great weekends, great trips. I actually wasn't there when she won the Sun Chariot. Uh, I was in Ireland, but watched on TV, which was great. I was there in Dover when she won the Rothschild, which was amazing. Um, and yeah, you know, filly of a lifetime. So if I can find one half as good, that'd be great. And is that trading element of the game something you think is going to still be necessary? We hear it from a lot of young trainers now. I've got to keep my my eyes open to trade. Yeah, definitely. Uh, look. If I was looking at the books of my business this year, has the business made money out of training? No, but we've we've traded a few horses well this year, and that's ultimately, unfortunately, that like that's not the way we want things to go. But that that's ultimately the only reason that my business has done, has done okay this year. Um, and yeah, look, um, one of the horses left the yard, which is always disappointing. You don't want um, the other two have managed to stay, which is great. Um, we've got some nice new owners in the yard, which I'm delighted about. But um, yeah, ultimately, in terms of the, the general finance of the business through just training the horses, it, it's 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 there's not a massive margin in it. I don't, not for me anyway. Because you like that urgency, because you like that competition, you obviously like the adrenaline of training, don't you? Sure, yeah, I think we all do. I'd say, yeah. I mean, you you seem quite quite a cool customer, but I'd imagine that <coughs> when when uh, inquisitively you got good money for, right? Yeah. He leaves the yard, uh, goes and wins at York at the Ebor Festival. Talk to me about how you're feeling at that point. Um, yeah, not not great. Um, 
I was sort of partially under the impression that he was leaving the yard to go to Hong Kong. Um, so naturally, when I see him two weeks later, ended up at York, it was a little um, surprising. But um, again, you only want to see the horse. You know, this is a horse that we put up to people mm. and we sold. And in reality, I'm only too delighted to see him go on and do well. And hopefully, they'll come back again. Exactly, and that's the thing. You've got punters yeah. coming back into the yard, yeah. and it's, it's all a <laughs> yeah. virtue. Yeah, we're, we're, look, we're not afraid to sell, sell the horses. You know, like I said, that's that's what's keeping the wheels. Turning and, and ultimately, like mm. I'd love to get to the stage where I have owners that don't need to sell or don't want to sell because we all want to train those good horses. But at the moment, a lot of my clients, you know, they're, they're, they're not they're not what you'd call just your owners. They're people who are professionally working in the industry. Yeah. So so the the sort of carrot of being able to race a nice horse for the rest of the year actually doesn't necessarily always do it for them. You know, they're, they're people who are making their living out of the industry and and. And selling a horse is, is, is obviously much more profitable than rolling the dice and racing a horse. You know, they're not all there to race the horses. I'm interested in the sort of profile of the yard, really, because <clears throat> most people would start and they'll... You sort of inherit things, don't you? You sort of inherit a bunch of horses, often a stable. I suppose with your being at Manton, you sort of had a blank bit of paper, and I'm quite interested that you focused very much on the two-year-olds. Yeah. Give us an idea of sort of the, the age distribution of the horses that yeah, were in your Yeah, so, so it wasn't necessarily through choice. You know, people always said, make sure in your first year you have a big brigade of handicappers that you know are well in and you can go to war with and win a couple with. And we've had some old horses that have done well. I had a horse called the Thunderer, one two, Philly called Cruisers, one two. But in reality, the ones I'm, that were easier to sell were the yearlings because most of my clients are racing based people mm. and would have more interest in buying either maybe they bred some of them or what have you but they would have more interest in buying a yearling filly than a 65 rated handicapper no no disrespect that could win two or three and be rated 78 you know that that sort of for, for the clients i had that that wasn't really what did it for them so as much as i wanted it to be sort of i had in my head i wanted it to be about 50 50 yearlings or two-year-olds to older horses, it, it's ended up being about 80-20. Which is rather unusual sort of horses. split, yeah. isn't it? And I suppose creates its own logistical issues in the sense you don't have that 65 rated handicap to send them up the gallops yeah. with to work yeah. out what they're yeah. worth. And, and nat naturally in the spring as well, um, you know, we, we were waiting to run the older horses and that's fine and we had we had five older horses, you know what I mean? And and the the lads in the yard are all wanting to run horses, we're all wanting to run mm. horses. And I wanted to get some of the two-year-olds out, but it was a very wet spring. And so, so it made me have to be a lot more patient, patient than I perhaps thought I was going to have to be. And, but that, that was just the, the, the layout of the yard. And, I, and I'd love to have had more older horses, but just, just the way you know, my clients are based, that, that, that kind of wasn't how, how it happened. And, and, and then naturally also, it's nerve-wracking having a yard full of two-year-olds, because if, mm. if I'd gone out and bought a load of not especially nice two-year-olds, it would have been a quiet <laughs> year. But thankfully, we managed to buy some half-decent ones. And so that you know that that's why it's working out. But and you say you love that side of things. Do you trust your eye? Do you do you know what you're looking for and what you want? Uh, yeah, I do. Look, um, when I say it's my eye, I've been lucky to have worked with some really really top agents, um, great people, and great people not just agents but great stud men, breeders all over the years um, who've who've taught me a lot. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd I'd be happy to back myself buying yearlings. Yeah, I, I love it. I love I love working the sales. That it's, it's such a big part of the industry, and a lot of trainers don't like doing it. But I really enjoy doing it. If you didn't back yourself, who would you back? If you were down to your last, <laughs> if you were down to your last few, I'm not sure. I, I worked with plenty of sales. Ben McElroy, who buys all of Barbara Banky's horses, Stone Street for Wesley. You know, he's obviously had a lot of success the last few years. Uh, Campanelle, amongst others. You know, he's a very good judge, good eye. Um, I think the Coolmore team obviously will do a fantastic job. Uh, their stats don't, obviously they have a nice budget to work with, yeah. but their stats don't lie. They buy fantastic horses year in, year out. Um, yeah, look, there's a lot of very good judges out there. Um, and I'd be only too delighted to work with some of them. But I, I also do think from a trainer's perspective, it's important to be active yourself at the sales. Um, I think you, a lot of, I would never have bought inquisitively if I wasn't active myself at the sales. Mm -hmm. He had an issue at the sales that an agent wouldn't have been able to buy him. He was lame. An agent can't buy a lame horse at the sales. Mm. But from a trainer's perspective, <coughs> the fact that I'd seen him and I, I know Flash, who was selling him well, enabled me to basically buy him on the trust with Flash and the relationship that we have that I think an agent wouldn't have been able to do, you know? Um, so, so I, I do think by by working the sales hard as a trainer yourself, you, 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 you know, 
you build good relationships, and I, I think it's a really important thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is I've been quite impressed by the placing of your horses. Is it something you spend a lot of time yourself doing? I mean, you've resisted the temptation with Shuari, for example, to sort of run before you can walk. You can see the sort of levels of progression yeah. that you're putting in place. And similarly, some of the maidens, uh, the pleasure of calling in, um, you know, the thanks to Colours, the maiden winner at, at Chepstow, yeah. which again was a good bit of placing considering the level of that race. You know, yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm happy. If I, I would say that's not, not one of my strong points. I, I'm, I'm fine placing the two-year-olds, maidens and what have you, you know, that's straightforward enough. I'm happy to work out the ground trip, right race. Um, in terms of the handicappers, my older horses, I get a bit of help. A friend of mine, Henry Lassell's cousin of mine, Ned, would help me along the way a bit um, with a bit of form and what have you. You know, it, it's a time-consuming job, and I would definitely say it's not one of my strong points. Yeah, but, but in terms of placing the two-year-olds, like... Yeah, that's that's I, I enjoy placing those, you know. Cause, but also, cause it's a strength to delegate what you're not particularly good at. Yeah, you know, accepting yeah. what you're not particularly good at. Yeah. But I certainly with Shawari, I, I like the building blocks that have, and obviously the forms worked out yeah, particularly yeah, the, well yeah, as well. Yeah, the forms, mm. forms, forms, you know, fantastic. Some of the best form in the book. So, so she's exciting, and it's nice to have her in the yard. Yeah. Here she is, winning the Star Stakes, beating Fallen Angel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fallen Angel nearest to you in the grey colours of the Clip Logistics. You're the far side there. What? Um, what does the next few months hold for Shuari? Um, she's in the Rockfell at the end of the month, which at the moment is where she's going to go. She was meant to run on the Prestige there at Goodwood last month, and she had a little setback, so we missed a little bit of time. Um, so, you know, it hasn't been a, as straightforward a prep into the Rockfell as I perhaps would have liked, mm -hmm. but she's training really well, and I'd be very happy with her now, but naturally, Missing a week never helps any horse, um, but it's also, yeah, I'm looking forward to the rock full at the moment. Yeah. And obviously, she's running there in the in the red and white socks. They're your mother's yeah, socks, yeah, are they're they? Mom's yeah, socks, yeah. Um, and Richard was mentioning the Chepstow winner in the yes, green, was, green, blue, and white. Yes, sold on to was, was it Wathnat that went yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Again, that's... Um, are you aware of the kind of? Nostalgic amount of goodwill there is when people see those. Yeah, those definitely. I, I have had. Post in front. <laughs> I've had a few people. You know, on, when we, we've had a couple of winners in the silks. Uh, maybe it's only two, but um, definitely people on Twitter saying, "Great to see the silks out yeah. again." Or love it, make, it makes him but, think but, he's calling the minstrel. Oh, that's the thing. It's, like, <laughs> it's really yeah. sad. Yeah, yeah. But I might have done both of them. There was the one at Chepstow. Was the other one at um, Salisbury? Salisbury. Yeah. Roman yeah. Over. Yeah. 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 So I've done, I've had. But 100 percent so far. <laughs> like I'm delighted to have had two winners in the silks, but. But, you know, they haven't exactly been dormant. Um, Sam, no. thanks to yeah. um, my uncle, uses them. And they, they've had, you know, between Isaac Shelby having a good mm -hmm. year and, and mm -hmm. well, obviously, it's now changed silks, but and Sam Syndicate's have had good, good years the last few years. You know, the, the silks have always been there. But you look across and see Sam. Um, when I look across for the trainer, I see Sangster and that sort of thing. Yeah, look, it's, 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 it's a privilege to be able to use them and, and, and hopefully I can use them on some nice horses along the way. And, and yeah, look, they've been used on far better horses than I've used them on so far. but. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's nice to be able to use them anyway. As you say, so far. This is 2023. This is Roman Over, trained by Ollie Sangster. This is 1977, the Minstrel? Yeah, the Minstrel. The Perhaps one of the most recognisable derby yeah, oh, finishes yeah, in white history. Face, white face always helpful. So what's your first... What sort of generation do you put yourself in with remembering horses that were in those? No, not not those this one. I, 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 I was 11, so I'm wondering if whether there was ever any crossover. I don't, no, I, I, don't, I don't put myself in remembering any of these horses, but but I've read Horse Trader about two, if not three times. Yeah. It, it is still, it remains one of the, the which actually, It's just been turned into an audio book. Or it's it? in the process of being turned into which an audio book. Which is really helpful on long journeys, My uncle Adam, who lives in Australia, he's he's been getting it done yesterday. Is he narrating it as well? No, uh, I can't remember who he's hired. He's hired someone to narrate it. And anyway, it, it's, it's in the process of doing that. I don't know if it's available yet or not, but that'll be great, yeah. Um, no, no, I, I look, I only have memories of those horses through, through what people tell me and from what I've read and what I've watched. And, you know, obviously, no, no direct memories, but yeah. Oh, well, it just gives us an excuse to sort of, yeah, you know, no. sort of dig, exactly. dig out yeah, some old that. archive. So here's another bonus for you. We've got one more for you. Still weren't born at this point. No, were you? I don't think. 92? No, you weren't. No, it was this Rodrigo. is just before. Yeah. Rodrigo, yeah. Five years before you were born. Yeah. Rodrigo de Triana. This is Lester's comeback. I, I do remember this quite distinctly, Neil. I remember both of those, actually. I did, the Minstrel, not. I think I only watched the Minstrel years. I was only 10. Yes, but, it was. Um, I, I, yeah, I think I might have been there for this. June Fall. June Fall, was he? Yep. 
And does that, you know, things like that, when you talk about going to the sales and people, oh, June fall, in your head, do you go, ah, oh, Rodrigo de Triano was a June fall? Uh, i say my old man definitely would. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's but nice, all nice, that, nice but to have all a that bit little, of direct correlation. All that background is nice, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And you still see some of the, they'll be fair far back now in the pedigree now, third, fourth dams. But listen, it's nice to see. Dad, Dad still has some families of his old man's old families still going now. And mm. So, you know, it's nice to see those still going. In. Um, it's great to see you doing so well. And uh, thanks so much for coming in today. Ollie, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Subscribe to Racing TV's YouTube channel now to watch more great races like this.